Good evening. Good evening. I have all my stuff. Of course, when I come into uh, the church, I have a couple of bags, and um, that's what we do, don't we? We just bring everything with us. That's what women do. But I'm uh, Holly Hall asked to come up and to make a declaration over all the kids that were baptized, and I think that's a great idea. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, um, a lot of the um, prophets are saying this is the year of the mouth, the decade of the mouth. This, we are in a new season. Amen. The more I think about that, the more excited I get because there is nothing but good stuff ahead of us, right? Okay, so in that sense, I decided that I needed to declare over these wonderful children and adults that came up and got baptized tonight I was just so excited about their comments. And so um, a dynamo is a live wire. <laughs> so we are declaring that these who got baptized tonight are dynamos, Amen. a powerhouse for God's Amen. glory, generating Hallelujah. light to light upon our world. We declare we will be bold and courageous. They will be bold and courageous. Kira, did you hear that? <laughs> to bring in the harvest of souls. We are a nation changer. Amen. And we'll stand our ground under pressure. Our testimony will release revival. Amen. Our words will change our world because we are the dynamo and it is in our mouth. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I am really excited about what's happening in our children's ministry and, and not just down in our children's ministry, but here in our sanctuary with the, um, the young people, the young men that are helping be our ushers. And a couple of weeks ago, I got a text message from one of our moms, and she said, my son, Baton, was excited to tell me how Mr. Ralph taught on baptism. Mr. Ralph, thank you. <clears throat> when we got home, he asked me during dinner, Mama, can I get baptized in three weeks when the church is going to do it? I asked, well, why? And he said, because I want more power from God. She said, how could I say no? He's six. And he hasn't had much experience being underwater. She talked about how she was going to help him. And then she said, my son's interest for God has strengthened since coming to Faith Center. And he has been known as the laid-back child, the one who listens and sits back. But now he's the one wanting more. He tells me how they encourage him to pray for other students at the church. And he has such a confidence when he's telling me. Isn't that exciting? And I agree. We want our kids to have a good time, and we want them to, to, to enjoy being down there. But, you know, they have a good time all week. Come on now. Right? They, they watch Disney all week. They play all week. And when they come to the house of the Lord, while we want them to have a good time, we want them to know exactly why they're here. They are here to learn about the things of the Lord and to learn what, they're, what, what God has given to them as as young men and women of God, and that there isn't anything they can't do, right? So I was just excited. One of our, one of our uh, young men that's an usher with Tim Bray, he um, was watching Superbook this week. His grandma was telling me about it. He was watching Superbook, and of course, that's a kid's kind of cartoon of the Bible. And he was watching the book of Revelation. And it came to the very end, and she said, he jumped up and he said, Jesus wins! Yeah. And then, she, and then she said, he goes, we need to pray. And I thought, yes, we do. And I was just so excited to hear that. Jesus wins, and he does win. And we want our kids to know Jesus always wins. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, we just thank you so much for how you're moving. We thank you for what you're doing in our young people and our children. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in every adult. I look at the lives of those that were baptized tonight, and Lord, there's not any age that you don't transform us, that you don't change us. 
Lord, that you don't teach us. And Heavenly Father, as we enter into the service tonight, we just take in what we heard this morning. And Lord, we welcome your presence. We welcome your presence in this sanctuary. We welcome your presence, Holy Spirit, by even as the word goes forth, how you're whispering, you're teaching us, you're lovingly prodding us into that, into that place of wanting more and doing more. So, Father, we receive your words tonight. The worship, as we are worshiping, said, let me trust without borders. Father, there's a new trust that's being built over each and every person in Faith Center tonight. So I just thank you for the message that you've given me. I know it's from you. And I pray that as I minister, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to each one about how you are, how you are using this word in their life. In the name of Jesus, amen. So my, um, t my message tonight is a little bit different. It's more instructional. And I was thinking, well, it's the, it's the not Super Bowl people. And uh, we like football. Yay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just, but we'll go to church, right? But, but for those of us that really love it, we just pray they have a good time tonight and that it just, their team wins, whoever it might be. And so, um, so I was thinking about that, and I just thought how it was, and, and I thought, so the ones that are here, you know, when you come on Super Bowl Sunday night, well then, that's, a, that's in you. That's what you do. You're, you're, you go to church. You're part of the house. That's, that's part of what you do. And I said, I'm really kind of preaching to the choir, but the Holy Spirit just kept saying, this is what you're going to teach. And I've never taught it before. It's kind of different. And it's instructional. And so... Um, I, I, I believe it's a word for each and every one of you because you're here. <clears throat> As I begin tonight, I want you to repeat this after me. I say yes to Jesus. I say yes to my assignment. So January's been a month of setting the mark for the year, 2020. Setting our vision on what the Holy Spirit is doing in both the faith family and our congregation, but also in our homes and in our personal lives individually. And during the month of January, we've had Prophet Ed Trout here, and then um, Pastor Michelle Daniels and our prophetic teams have taken Sunday night, and there's been a lot of just releasing what, what we've seen, what God is going to be doing then this year, and what he's saying. Jumping into the new. 2020 vision. Faith lock. I don't know if you remember Apostle's message, his first message of the, of the year. Faith lock. We're putting in a faith lock. I have a visual of that ever since he said it. Year of Holy Spirit, Apostle Bird has been declaring it's the year of Holy Spirit. As 2019 was ending, the Lord was, told me that he wanted one of the prayer directors for the year to be pray for labors. And you've heard me um, say that. And one of the things I do here at Faith Center is I oversee the prayer ministry. When he spoke that to me, I saw, I saw the people of Faith Center. I saw each and every one of you sitting in your seats. And you were sitting in your seats in the sanctuary, praying for and encouraging and administering to the people that you were sitting next to. Now, it wasn't because we said, turn and minister and pray for the one you're sitting next to, but it was because at some point during the time that you always sit in the seat that you always sit in, you've come to know the people in your row or the people in front of you or behind you, and you've, and you've just felt prompted, the Holy Spirit has ministered to you that to, to, to get to know them better, to start speaking to them, and that that conversation has led to a place where you can encourage them. He said, I'm not talking about evangelists or missionaries, but that each one that already knows me is using their strength and their testimony, their freedom, their deliverance, and their faith that I have increased in them through, the pro through their process of trusting me with the knowledge that they will bless others. So in the process that you've been in as you've grown in the things of the Lord, when you've put in that faith lock, 
When, you've, when you have taken those, those steps, when you've walked outside of your comfort zone, when you've, when you've taken that extra step to obey the Lord, that's been a process for you, and it's been a place where you've walked it out. Yes? yes. So willing, willing to take the extra five to ten minutes to labor with how, to labor with them how God has strengthened you. Just taking some extra time, not taking the head of a department, not taking over a ministry, but taking some extra time to be a laborer. Isaiah 119 says, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. I've learned that being willing and obedient is a place that we always come back to. We're there, and then we do really good, and we're on a roll, and somebody asks us to do something, or something happens, and we've got to come back to that place of being willing and obedient. I've learned that being willing and obedient is a place that we come back to, and a place of willingness and stepping into obedience to what he's prompting us to do that brings a greater dimension into my life, especially when it's really hard. Every time you stop what you would normally do, the way you would normally do something, and yield to what Holy Spirit says to you, you make room for a greater dimension of Holy Spirit to not just use you, but to transform you. I'm going to say that again. Every time you stop what you normally do, your normal process and your normal habit, every time you stop and you yield to what Holy Spirit says to you, you make room for a greater dimension of Holy Spirit to not just use you, but that's where he begins to transform you. This morning, Apostle ministered to us about God's presence in our lives making room and time for his presence. Now let's remember, our apostle is 88 years old. He's been in the ministry for over 60-some years. And he's telling us, I need more of his presence. So he's stopping what he normally does out of the normal process of his everyday life, and he's saying, I'm making room for more of that presence. And I know that there's an, another transformation coming. Acknowledging his presence and guarding it. You will experience as much of his presence as you're willing to guard. You will experience and you will carry as much of his presence as you're willing to guard. A couple of weeks ago, I was having a conversation with myself about how I was going to respond in a conversation that I knew I was about ready to have. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, you haven't even asked me. So I just let go and I said, okay, how should it go? And I waited for his response and he said, well, first, you need to show them your respect for them. Willing to prefer them. When I was growing up, my mother would always say to us, in honor preferring one another. But I heard him say, you need to be willing to prefer them. And then he showed me what to say, and it wasn't anything close to what I had told myself earlier. But that discussion turned out really well for both of us. And I had to be willing to let go of what I wanted to what Holy Spirit wanted me to focus on. And there's a place where, and I believe that that's where we are this year, that we stop ourselves from what our normal is. An apostle has said it's the year of the Holy Spirit. That means we have to stop ourselves and say, okay, Holy Spirit, what's, what's different here? What's changing here? Paul said in Romans 2, 4, Or do you show contempt, think lightly of his goodness, for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. You know, one of the things that we don't see much of anymore is respect. Respect means that we have regard for another. We regard their feelings, their abilities, their qualities, where they've come from, and we remember 
that we don't know the whole of their story. We don't know all of their story. When I look for a place to respect another person, and there's always something, even when I don't agree with them, I can find something to respect. And when I respect them, it's easy to be kind, and it's easy at that point for them to work with that, that conversation that we're beginning to have. The text tonight is Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Then Jesus went about all of the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the, our, the, his our harvest. The word weary means just that. It means weary and faint, weakened by the circumstances and lack of resources to handle those circumstances. Scattered actually means thrown down, tossed away, left, and disqualified. So Jesus was saying about the people that they're faint, they're weary, they lack resources, and they feel completely left and disqualified. And I believe that is what Jesus was showing me, was that even in the house, and those who are coming to the house, there are those who come, but they still believe they're disqualified and that they're out of resources. Your strength, your strength, can bring a new resource to them that opens up a greater dimension to them that they need to turn to. How God has grown you. How God came into you. The more we extend the goodness of God, the more we extend the goodness God has given to us, to those we sit next to, the more likely we are to step out and speak his goodness to those that we work with, live next to, and find ourselves next to in each Days processes. One of the ladies in our church told me this morning that she was a waitress and she was um, working Friday night and one of the tables that she was at, she just felt really drawn to this woman who just kept rubbing her neck the whole time. She said, every time I approached the table, she was rubbing her neck. And she said, I was a little fearful. I didn't really want to, you know, I didn't really know what to do. And she said, all of a sudden, Apostle Lion walked into the restaurant and these people talked to him. And she said, I thought, well, if he knows them, then, then they're at least God-friendly. They, they <laughs> and so she said, as I came to the end, she said to the lady, she goes, I just, I just have felt really drawn to you. And she said, I'd just really like to pray for your neck. And so she prayed for that woman. And that, and that woman said, yes, go ahead. And see, once she prayed for that woman, there was an avenue for God to heal her. But if she would never have stepped out, if she wouldn't have kind of been that laborer, then there wouldn't have been an opportunity for God to touch her and heal her. The way was made open. It was prepared. Jesus told the disciples, pray for labors, and he was looking directly at the crowd that was following him. It was a crowd that he had been healing them and teaching them. He was right in front of them, just like Apostle Lion is right in front of us every Sunday morning. He was right in front of them, but he said to the disciples, I need laborers that can help clear the confusion in their lives and point their faith in the right direction and show them that they are qualified. We can't just rely on the message that comes from the pulpit. He needs laborers that are in the field. He needs laborers that are sitting there. In the story of the man delivered from the legion of demons, one of the things that always stands out to me in Mark 5, 18, and it says, and when he got into the boat, this was Jesus after he had cast the, the demons out of him, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but he said, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. 
What he was telling him was, go home to your friends and strengthen them. I've brought deliverance to you. That's been, you you know what that is. You know what led you to being filled with those demons. And he said, and I've cast those demons out and I've ministered to you. And so I need you to go home and to speak that to your family and friends. Um, If any of you watch uh, It's Supernatural with Sid Roth, I don't really, because I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not home during the day, but I have this really good friend that sends me a lot of her, his videos. And there was a, a man on there, his name was Kevin Zedekai, Zadai, the story of Kevin Zadai. And he had died on, he had gone in for an oral procedure where they had to put him under, and when that happened, he, he died. And he went to heaven. And when he was in heaven, and he, and he was giving his testimony, so obviously he came back, because God wasn't done, but, but he, it was a long, I'm not going to tell you everything, but one of the things was that when he was in heaven, he saw the book that God had written about him before he was even in his mother's womb. He said, I saw what God wrote about me before I was even in my mother's womb. And he said, I knew what God had for me. And so he said, every morning when I wake up, I say yes to Jesus. I say yes to what was written in my book. I say yes to my assignment. So repeat after me. I say yes to Jesus. I say yes to to my assignment. assignment. Holy Spirit said, each one that already knows me, using their strength and their testimony, their freedom, their deliverance, their faith, that I have increased in them through the process of trusting me, obeying me, with that knowledge that will bless others and that will coach others. You know, a lot of times we coach. I know a lot of times we hear that word mentoring. But there are, like, you know, my kids will call me, and they'll pretty much know what they need to do, but I kind of have to coach it. Or my husband will have to coach it and add the pieces that they're missing. And so many times, those that were around, they know, but they don't. And you've gone through that process. God has healed you. God has brought deliverance to you. I remember when Susan got saved. I always remember it. And she went after deliverance like nobody I ever saw. She was a nail tech, and that's how I knew her. She did my nails. And she got saved, and every time I'd go in, she would just tell me something else. (laughs) And I always didn't, because Susan, when God says something, she'll do it. She will do it. She'll go after it until she gets it. And that's what happens when we coach. When when God has brought us through, and we become a laborer, we begin to encourage that one that God's placed around our lives and we fill in the missing pieces. Each of us has grown in the knowledge of the word and in our faith by the strength that we obtain through our walk with the Lord. For instance, prayer is my strength. I have no problem praying. If there's a prayer meeting and I'm tired, that doesn't bother me. And I can remember when... I can remember when I knew, I, can, I, was sit, I was on an elliptical exercising, and I was reading Apostle Mary Alice's book on prayer. This was back in the late 90s. And all of a sudden, I knew God hears every one of my prayers. I knew that when I prayed, it wasn't like buying a lottery ticket with everybody else in the room praying. Whose prayer is going to get answered? I know he hears my prayer. And, and, I, and so prayer has been that vehicle that with everything else I do in trusting God, it's been that vehicle that I, I get strength from. When I go to prayer, the word of God becomes revelation to me. When I go to prayer, I, I immediately start setting myself up to hear him, to hear his response. And each of us has that place. Apostle Birds 
came into faith through deliverance. He was in prison, and you got delivered. And then you went after your deliverance. And you know exactly how to get deliverance. And so that process of getting deliverance is what has opened up the door for him with different ones that come into this sanctuary through Mighty X Men, Mighty X Women that have addictions. He knows how because he walked that. And through that place of deliverance, that was a strength to him. Apostle Lion's strength is integrity. Apostle Lyons has integrity in his sleep. <laughs> you might think that's funny, but I'm his daughter, and that's true. He will always do the right thing. And you say, is that a strength? Well, when the woman in the Bible that was healed with the issue of blood and she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, Jesus said, who touched me? Virtue has left me. Do you know what virtue is? Virtue is integrity. Jesus had the anointing of integrity. And a couple of weeks ago when Apostle Bird was preaching about receiving our Apostle's anointing, I was really praying and, and just meditating upon that. And I remember when the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, Marla, your father's anointing is in his integrity. I've anointed because he's walked it when nobody else saw He's done the right thing when everybody else would have done something different. He followed what I asked him to do. And that's his anointing. If, you, if we try to mimic somebody else's, and, and what I want to add to that, when we look at David in the Bible, his strength was worship. So even though, praise and worship, so even though he fought battles and he slayed giants and he was the king over a nation, the place that he found his strength, that place that he went to. In fact, when we think about um, Ziklag, and all had failed, and he cried when he couldn't cry anymore, the Bible says he began to encourage himself. See, he went to his strength. Praise and worship was his strength, and you have a strength that you come to God in and that you grow in. God gave Samson his strength to deliver the people of Israel from the Philistines. While he understood his strength, that he couldn't cut his hair and that he must maintain the vow of a Nazarite, the angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's mother. Now, this was right before she had conceived him in Judges 13, 7. And I want you to pay attention to this verse. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, nor drink anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. This means that his parents kept him separated, and his focus was on being holy while they were raising him. It's all he knew. That was how he was raised. His strength was an anointing from God, and besides being really strong, he was raised holy, taking the vow of a Nazarite. And while he grew in physical strength, he also grew in the strength of the knowledge of Jehovah. Now we know from the story that he took a, a, a wife from the Philistines, and the Philistines killed her, and then he, took, and then he, he went with Delilah. And Delilah betrayed him twice, and of course, you know, we always think, how could you be so stupid? But he was. <laughs> and, um, and so even after she had betrayed him and they shaved his head, the Philistines came, they took him, they shaved his head, and he became a prisoner of the Philistines. But he wasn't just sitting in a Philistine prison, blind and dumb and bald. Samson went back to his strength. Samson was going back to being a Nazarite. Samson was going back to how he grew in that strength. He came back to the vows he made before all of that strength came. And the vow of a Nazarite was his strength, even to his death. David's strength was praise and worship to the Lord. Your strength is where you hear from God. 
how he's grown you. And as a laborer of Jesus, we can coach to our strength and impart it to those that we are mentoring, that we are blessing, and that we are teaching. Now I have one last point about labors. Labors literally means for hire. That's what it means. And Jesus said, because when you look up the word labor, it means for hire. I am going to hire you to do this job. Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 9 to pray for labors. And so many times the thing that distracts us from taking that extra time when we're here at church or when we know that there's somebody that we, we could encourage is everything we've got to get done. Right? A lot of times I'm in the back, I'm at that window of opportunity selling something. <laughs> And I mean, there are people that hit that door in less than a minute from the amen. I mean, <laughs> they, they are out like lightning. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes they stick around a little bit longer. But, you know, because we're, and I talk to some of them. I go, oh, I wanted to talk to you this morning. They go, oh, I know, but I had to, I had to hurry up, and I was meeting so-and-so. And, I, and we all have things that we have to do. We have things that we have to get done, and maybe you do have to get to work. But I was, it was interesting to me when Prophet Ed Trout was here that um, on Sunday morning when he was here, he was ministering to one of our young men who had really just had a crisis that week, pretty, pretty serious one. There were just a few of us that knew about it. So when Prophet Ed called him out, I thought, oh, good. Well, um, a couple of weeks later, I was talking to one of the men, and he was telling me that he, he was meeting so-and-so for a cup of coffee. And I go, really? And this guy is just, he's a wonderful father in the faith, just a strong believer, and God has done so much in his life. And he said, you know, when the prophet was ministering to him, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you need to encourage that young man. You have a lot you can give to him. And so he said, I just said, can we meet? Can I help you? And he meets with them every week. He's being a laborer. Now I happen to know that he has an extremely responsible job. And his time is very, very valuable. But he's taken that time because he heard the Holy Spirit tell him to do it. For the past five months, you've heard me declare Haggai 2.8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. That's kind of been something that the Lord has just been showing me. Everything belongs to him. Psalms 50, 12 says, if I were hungry, this is God talking, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you because it's all mine. And, it's, and the fullness of it, it's, it all belongs to me. There is a place of trusting God's wages over what you perceive as your provision that comes from the skills that God placed in you for your job. All of what we possess, everything that we earn, it comes from him. Our skill comes from him. Our brain comes from him. All of the knowledge that you have, your brain, what if you didn't have a brain? Come on. That's something we all value is our brain. Your ability... For the skill and the talent that the Lord has given you, he's given it to you. It came from him. And all of it belongs to him. Matthew 10 tells us the story of the rich young ruler who asked Jesus, what more must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus told him to keep the commandments, and he responded that he had done all those things since his youth. See, that young man came to Jesus, and he wanted more. And when we ask God for more, many times... He's pointing to that thing that we're trusting in that distracts us from receiving that more. So seeing what the young man desired, but also knowing what was really holding him back, Jesus says, the one thing that you lack, sell everything that you have, give to the poor, take up your cross and follow me, and you will have treasures in heaven. And we know that he couldn't do it, and that he walked away sad. And Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew 10, 24 that it's harder for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Now let me tell you why that's hard for them. 
because the lie that the rich man believed was that his wealth was his. See, that's what he believed. Because if you believed it was the Lord's, you would give it to him. Remember our Haggai 2.8? The silver and gold, they're mine. When we know that everything that we have come, everything that we have comes from the Lord, then we know that if I give it, he can only give me more. He'll only give me more. It's what he promises. As well, when we labor for the kingdom, he will bring wages, he, and he does it in a way that we can't imagine. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So moving forward in Matthew 10, in that chapter of the rich young ruler, we know that Peter says to the Lord, he says, well, we've left everything. We've followed you. And what did Jesus say back to him? Jesus answered, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands. I want you to remember relationships. For my sake and the gospel, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. So not just houses and lands, but relationships and family. Because the thing that we always have to remember is when we go to heaven, the only thing we take with us is people. That's all we take. We don't take anything else. Like Prophet Ed says, the Muslims get it all. (laughs) They get it all. But we take people. And we take those people that you sit next to, and we take those people that you work next to, and we take those people that, we, that you live next to. So whenever we're running out of church to go and do whatever it is we have to do, its wages will not compare to how God will provide when we give our strength, our skills, and our trust in him because we know that it's all his. Your money, your skills, your brain, and your influence. George Stormont declared to this house in May of 1987, Faith Center will never outgrow the resourcefulness of God. That was 33 years ago. And I want each and every one of you to know, you will never outgrow the resourcefulness of God. When you take time to just obey whatever he tells you to do, that's all. I want you to repeat after me. I say yes to Jesus. I say yes to my assignment. And all it is is what God says, nothing else. Just what he says. That's the only thing. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Holy Spirit told me that his reward and his wages operates in the same way as forgiveness. And I shared with you several times that even in forgiveness, when we forgive those who have wronged and harmed us, that the lie that still lingers is, I forgive you, but you owe me. In other words, I forgive you, but until you in some way return or pay back or do some sort of homage, I am going to keep you in, uh, I'm going to keep a safe distance. See, Matthew 6, 12, when um, the disciples asked Jesus how we should pray and he taught them how to pray, he said, Forgive us our debts, that which is owed, that that we owe, because we've wronged, as we forgive our debtor, those who owe us. And the reason that Christ never one time says that we have to pay back the debt from sin that we owe is because it would never be enough. It would never be enough. No matter what someone is awarded in damages in court, that person is still never really satisfied. Only Christ can fully satisfy our loss because he's the redeemer. And he doesn't require payback, but he does require forgiveness so that he can redeem. So the redeeming comes when we forgive and when we let go of the debt. And in the same way, that's how reward works. And the worship team can come out. 
In the same way, that's how reward works. The wages of the Lord, the reward of the Lord, doesn't run out. Joseph's willingness and obedience and the faith that Joseph used when he was in prison to minister to those that were in that prison, to other prisoners, brought a great reward to him that never ran out. For that widow who fed Elijah that last meal and then they were going to die, her meal bin never ran out. There's a scripture in Hebrews 6, 9 to 12. And it says, But beloved, we are confident of better things according, concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show that same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Laborers are hired. And when we say yes to Jesus, we say yes to his wages. We say yes to his favor. We say yes to his reward. And we say yes to the promise. And we say yes to the inheritance. Because it's above more than anything we can ask or think. Isaiah 50, 4 to 5 says, The Lord has given to me the tongue of the learned that I would know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor I did not turn away. And you know, when I was preparing to preach this message, and I thought, Lord, you know, this is a different kind of message. He said, Marla, the people of Faith Center have the tongue of the learned. A lot of good teaching happens from this house, and it's in you. And it's time to be a laborer. It's time to coach. It's time to pray. It's time to encourage. It's time to encourage a deliverance. And you know, what you had to say to an individual, how you might encourage them, tomorrow they may find themselves in a situation where all of a sudden those words come downloading. And they think, like this morning, Apostle's message on the presence. And they just set themselves, they go somewhere where they can be alone and say, Lord, I need your presence. I've never invited your presence here in this place. But I'm asking your presence to visit me. I'm asking so that I can hear your voice, that I can have that impression on my heart and in my mind to know exactly what to do. Coach from your strength so that those who are weary and those who feel disqualified, you can bring that courage into their life.